Today, I'm going to be talking a little bit about the critical value of the arts for learning and for a bunch of other things. So I'm a researcher, and I study learning at the intersections of STEM, arts, making, and embodiment. My research today focuses on the design and ethnographic study of learning environments that blend STEM and creative embodied learning activities, particularly for children who have experienced marginalization in STEM. Now let me tell you what I mean by that, because that's a mouthful. That means I design and study the actions, interactions, and opportunities for learning in environments that blend things like science and dance making, math and music making, creative thinking and technology, for kids who don't typically identify as STEM learners or STEM confident. So I'm interested in understanding the ways that youth draw on their everyday practices and use their bodies and movement as resources for learning. My work interrogates and complicates the ways that we think about sense making, especially in informal learning environments, places where learning is happening outside of schools. For me, that's typically like dance studios, maker spaces, libraries, and sometimes in the home. Where STEM is not just STEM, science is not something that happens in science class. Movement can be more than just movement, and the pathways to learning are not linear, normative, or even really always predictable. Now, I'm giving you this setup so that I can help you understand that my work has really mirrored my own life and my own experiences. I am a chemical engineer. I'm a dancer. I'm a dance educator, and I'm a learning scientist. I grew up with a love for math, for science, and for dance. So I was one of those kids that like made up my own math problems for fun. That was like the way that I played as a kid. I was the person who was always getting in trouble when I was five and six and seven years old because I was really fascinated to understand how things work. So, I took them apart. I would take apart the iron. I would take apart the remote control and try to put them back together and usually could almost get them put back together, but there would be one or two pieces missing and most of the stuff would still work. But I got in trouble a lot because I was always trying to get to the bottom of how things worked. I always got in trouble a lot as a kid too because I was always moving. So my mom put me in dance lessons when I was about two years old. And she would tell you that it's because as I was learning to walk, I would walk around on my toes all the time. She would also tell you that as I got to be an older teenager, she would be really annoyed with me because we would go grocery shopping and she'd be like, hey, can you pick up that thing off the shelf? And I'd be, you mean that one? She'd be like, put your leg down, you're in the store, what do you mean? I was dancing throughout the grocery store. I was dancing everywhere. I've always been and considered myself a mathematician, a scientist, and a dancer. But I also grew up always being told that I was going to have to make a choice, that I wasn't going to be able to pursue a career that would allow me to follow my artistic passion and my engineering passion, that, you know, the arts are not necessarily all that practical, and so you're going to have to have some kind of backup plan if you choose the arts. What are, what's your real job going to be? I, was, I felt pressured in high school because I went to a performing arts high school, but I was also an academic scholar. And my math and science teacher would tell me, look, you know, if you're going to be on the academic Super Bowl team, you can't do the school musical. My school musical director would be like, hey, you can't focus all your time over there in math, extra math class, when we need you in rehearsal. You're going to have to make a choice. And I have always rejected that notion. Because from a very young age, I recognized that the arts and the sciences were both important parts of my being and both critical lenses for how I made sense of the world. They were both very important to me. And I never really saw them as separate entities. I developed as a dancer because of my understanding of physics, math, biology, chemistry. I made sense of math and science through my experiences as a dancer. But as a young learner, I was always told I had to choose. And eventually I chose engineering, but dance chose me. 
So I can remember my first day of undergrad, I was at Florida A&M University on an academic scholarship in a chemical engineering major, and I had been told that it was going to be the most challenging thing I'd ever done in my life. These courses were going to be so difficult, and I was going to have to focus in order to keep my scholarship, maintain my GPA. And so I said, okay, going into this fall semester, First of all, this was after a summer of being on tour dancing in about five different states with the dance company in Indiana. But fall started, I said, okay, I'm gonna go into this fall semester, I'm not gonna dance anymore. Had a fun summer, that was the end of it. I'm gonna focus on these classes. And as I was walking across class, campus to my first class, I saw a sign posted that said, dance company auditions today. And I was like, I'm there. <laughs> And that was the end of my brief stint of deciding that I had to choose one over the other. I danced all four years through college. And what I came to recognize is that dancing really helped me to matriculate through that engineering program successfully because it provided an outlet for me to really de-stress from the difficult classes that I was taking. It provided me the cognitive space because I didn't have the stress that I was dealing with, the time to process the ideas that I was learning in those classes. But it also not only gave me an outlet, it provided perspectives that deepened my understandings of mechanics, of physics, of fluid dynamics, of all of those things that I was studying because I could relate to how those things happened in my body. Throughout my education and my career, I've pushed back on the narrative that the arts and sciences should be separate, constantly creating spaces where I could engage in arts and sciences together. I started a creative arts center in 2004 in Gary, Indiana, not far from here, where I developed a curriculum that infuses math, science, literacy, writing into dance activities. And now as a learning scientist, my research looks at learning at these intersections. So learning sciences deals with three aspects of learning and how it happens. We look at cognition, and that's kind of the way sense-making happens inside the individual brain. So like what's happening when you're doing a thing that's allowing you to learn? It also looks at the social context of learning. And so that's like, how, are, how is your learning affected by the person you're sitting next to, the people in your class, the people in your school, in your family, in your community, your cultural influences? All of these things have impacts on how you make sense of the world and how you make sense of the information that enters your brain. And then it also focuses on design. And that's thinking about ways to construct learning environments that will lead to understanding that will lead to different ways of sense making. And design is, is really the place where what most of my work is seated. So I design arts and STEM integrated, and integrated environments and study their impact on cognition, on sense making, and identity. And the, the environments that I look at are, have a lot to do with science, technology, and dance. Some people will tell you that the arts are not the practical choice. This is something that I've heard almost my entire life. Then there are some that will advocate for the importance of the arts by saying, you know, there's this phrase, science saves lives, arts makes life worth living. I'm here to present a different kind of argument today, though. And that's not one that pits one against the other, but helps us to realize that both arts and sciences are valuable tools. They're valuable resources for learning and for sense making. And they can be collaborative tools that when, are, when they're put together, they help you develop as healthy learners. So here are a few of the things that I've learned. Number one, creative embodiment is a tool for scientific sense making. First of all, Embodying science is something that scientists do. Researchers have documented physicists doing physical reenactments to take on the perspectives and empathize with the objects of their analysis to better understand them. The process of embodying those objects of study allows them to make connections that help them make sense of and reason about the mechanisms that drive the things they study. Structural biologists and biological engineers build models of biological mo molecules through body experiments. 
graduate students, science researchers, who have begun participating in competitions that challenge them to use dance to communicate their research, have reported that the process of dance making allows them to gain an entirely new perspective on the things that they're studying. For youth, dance can also be a way of developing insights about science ideas and phenomena, technologies, complex systems, and computation. In my work, I look at informal STEM learning settings where youth are asked to do things like create dynamic science representations, dances that use choreography and electronic technolo technologies that they design and build to explore and explain science ideas. Things that, programs that ask them to work collaboratively to develop and design STEM-based computing projects that are rooted in the elements and practices of hip hop and programs that ask them to bring their cultural and dance-making practices to explorations of physics, computing, and modeling. Creating dances about scientific phenomena of interest has led children to deepen their understanding of science content, to engage in complex forms of reasoning and perspective taking, and to make their thinking explicit and accessible to each other to utilize for sense making. And it's amazing watching youth engage in choreographing science. Modeling ideas with their bodies deepens their understanding of things like complex dynamic systems that are usually hidden from the eye, the human eye, like things, systems that are operating inside their bodies, like the nervous system. This group right here was creating a dance that modeled how the brain sends messages to the body. And they, they had to get inside the perspective of a neuron in order to do that. So then questions came up about, well, like, what do neurons actually do? It was a fascinating discussion because in this particular part of this conversation, they were modeling the passing of information from one neuron to the other with a little electronic energy stick. The energy stick rep represented the message, that, the electronic message that was being passed from one neuron to the other, right? But in this moment, this little girl in the blue shirt shifts the idea to say, okay, well, maybe we can be the energy that's passing and we can use our bodies to represent that flow. This turned into a bunch of different ideas that went from stories about trips to Disney World and people riding in the car and getting in the car crash. And I say that not to, not to, not to explore like the extent of how big the idea got, but to kind of tell the story that in that experience, expansive thinking about what they could possibly do with the choreography, it raised questions. Because now we're in a car and we get in a car accident and we now have to represent the neurons in some way, like are we inside the body? Are we outside of the body? What do neurons do? And someone was like, okay, well, the neurons are going to be panicking, so we should just run around because the nerves would be panicking because we're in a car accident. And somebody else was like, well, wait a minute, no, the nerves don't actually panic. That's not what nerves do in the system. What do they do? So now they have to go back and research and say, well, wait, how do you represent what nerves do in the system? Are the nerves actually moving? What is the thing that's moving? And all of these questions are coming up just from these five kids working together to choreograph a dance. It's pretty amazing. Using their bodies for sense making pushed them to think about the multiple aspects of a phenomenon simultaneously from each individual perspective and then also think about how all of those perspectives had to work together to create the, the complete picture. It also provides a way for them to physically connect to the science through their kinesthetic senses. So this can be especially helpful when you're trying to understand physics concepts like things that are pretty obvious, gravity, fiction, forces. When you can feel those things happening in your body, it's easier for you to understand what those concepts are and what they mean. Exploring science concepts using dance practices also heightened their orientation for experimentation by providing a useful framing that encouraged them to test out ideas, to iterate and revise, to hypothesize, and to model, which I'll talk about a little bit later. And importantly, it helped them to be generally okay with uncertainty. These are skills that are really, really useful when engaging in science. Engaging in the messiness of making allowed them to grow comfortable with learning to say, I don't know. 
I don't know what happens when a neuron, when a person gets in a car accident. I don't know what the neurons do. Let's go find out. Let's ask someone. Let's look it up. Let's Google it. That's the way they do research. Everything is now, I'm going to go do research. Google. What happens when it, but it's, it's a start. It leads to more questions. <laughs> Uh, it helps them define problems, learn to define problems, and to choose which ones to tackle and which ones to leave out. It also encourages a sense of wonder about phenomena and a sense of effic efficacy around STEM exploration more broadly. Big idea number two, creative thinking is for artists and for scientists. The thing about observing kids in informal learning spaces where they have creative freedom is that you see all kinds of amazing and innovative ways of working. They bring in and utilize a range of practices for science exploration, including school practices, family practices, cultural practices, creative practices. And in making sense of their sense making, I initially went into it spending a lot of time trying to identify what they were doing how what they were doing was art practices, or which of the things they were doing were science practices, and trying to make some arguments about how these things were working together, but I found it really, really hard to do that. It was challenging to tease them apart for a couple of reasons. First, the arts and sciences often share overlapping practices, especially when it comes to creation and discovery. For example, in developing New representations, scientists, engineers, and artists engage in things like abstracting, improvisation, iteration, revision, editing, even as they explore different kinds of questions. Second, in the context of the work that these kids were doing, which was like STEM and art making, their exploration of phenomena was approached in ways that were interdisciplinary. So they were combining arts and science practices in ways that were really novel and, and not really additive. So you couldn't say, well, this part was science and this part was dance because it was really a blend of activities. I'll give you an example. For this group that you're going to see, I'm not going to play the sound, but you can kind of watch them in the, in the background. This group of young ladies worked to create a dance that explained Saturn, the formation of the planet Saturn, and how the planet and its Roche limit, the rings were developed around the Roche limit, which they taught me. I didn't know what a Roche limit was. I can, I can answer that question if somebody wants to know later. <laughs> the dance that they created, which you can see here, was not really just about them making movements. They created physical and embodied models as part of their work process. These models served different purposes. They built models for inspiration. They started out by building clay models as a part of their brainstorming session to help them generate ideas for their project piece. They built a prototype to help them figure out how to wire lights and a battery as they envision their final Saturn prop, which you can see it's that little gold kind of half circle on the top and half circle on the bottom. And it's hard to see, but there's a spinning ring of LED lights in the middle. They constructed that foam model to, to represent scientific aspects of the phenomena that they didn't want to represent through their dance. Constructing the physical prototype led to generative discussions about the, for, the phenomenon of planet formation. They used modeling as a way to practice circuit building, ask questions, affirm their understandings, and apply new knowledge and technical skills. To engage in troubleshooting, experimenting, and hypothesizing when the technology didn't work in the ways they expected, and embedded in their attempts to bring their technical ideas to life were conversations design conversations that required attention to choreographic choices. For example, when they tried to figure out how many LED lights to use and where they should situate the battery, that had implications for how they would display the planet, which had implications for their choreography. Should we mount the planet? Should we hang it? Should somebody carry it and move it around? If there's a battery, it might be too heavy to carry around. Maybe if it's mounted, it might be too heavy. If it's if it's on the ground, it might be in the way. So they had to figure out what they should do and how they should create the piece in order to fit with the technology that they were building. Modeling the phenomena and iterating on their ideas impacted how they developed their ideas and how they thought about the representational possibilities by prompting discussions about the important features of the phenomena that they wanted to highlight, 
how they would do it, which were essential, and which could be left out of their final representation. This is meta-representational competence, which is an important skill for scientists and for artists. The process of dance making, as I said before, required them to do a lot of research on their topic in order to develop the choreographic explanation. So they had conversations about choreography that were science conversations and conversations about science that were creative and artistic. Again, really hard to tease apart which part is the art and which part is the science. You can't really define it as simply engineering or simply art because it integrated art and science and engineering. Art and science are actually a lot alike. And we often miss that because we tend to focus on the artistic product or the scientific product and not the processes that lead to those products. But creative thinkers, whether they're artists or scientists, actually use a lot of the same creative thinking tools in the work that they do. They're both observing, they're imaging, abstracting, recognizing and forming patterns, they're analogizing, body thinking, empathizing, dimensional thinking, modeling, playing, transforming, dropping things, and synthesizing. These are the skills that we should be focused on teaching learners. Skills that can be developed through the arts and the sciences. And importantly, developed through experiences that integrate the arts and the sciences. The arts and the sciences are equal in value. It's not really about choosing one over the other. It's more about continuing to expand the set of tools that you have in your toolkit. Each language provides a different lens, a different perspective, and a different set of resources. So, as you can see, arts are a pretty valuable resource for science learning and sense making. But the power of the arts can be even greater. And I'll tell you what I mean by that. This is my big point number three. Arts can be a resource for radical healing. So now I'm going to get into some new work that I'm starting to think about. I might have said this, I can't remember, I've done three talks today, but I have a dance school in Gary, Indiana. I started a dance school about 17 years ago, a creative arts center, and developed programs at that school that integrate dance, science, math, reading, writing, and history as part of a, as part of a complete curriculum. And as part of that curriculum, we created a production called The Spirit of the Baobab Tree. It's a youth dance -umentary which means it's kind of like a play that is a historical timeline of events that tell 500 years of African and African-American history. But it's done completely with dance music and a couple of monologues. So there's no dialogue, there's just dance. The curtain comes up, the story is told through movement and choreography. There's an intermission, the curtain comes up, the rest of the story is told through movement, music, and choreography, the curtain comes down, the show is over. It's not like, we do a dance, blackout, next scene. We do a dance. It's just one full story. It's kind of like a play. My students have been performing this dance documentary since 2007. So it's been about 15 years. And as I said, it uses music, dance, and monologues to tell the story of a young boy who journeys through time with his classmates to discover the connections between the historical events of his past or of the past and his present day circumstances. So we didn't get to do the performance in this past year because of COVID. But I used that as an opportunity to interview some of the people who participated as dancers in the production over the past 15 years. And I was interested in understanding how the elements of the production, the process of participating in this, in this dance making production, and the actual performance provided protection factors or resilience or uh, increase their level of hope for the people that were participating. So I want to talk a little bit about this too. When I say the process of participating in the production, this is a production that we build every year with a cast of students. The youngest person is sometimes six years old and the oldest is in college. So we have a cast and every year it's a community arts center. So I don't know how familiar you guys are with community art spaces, but the cast that you're gonna get of characters that walk through the door changes every time. So sometimes we do the show and there's 35 kids and they're all 12. 
And sometimes we do the show and there's 20 kids and they range in age from 6 to 22. Sometimes there's 50 kids and we got to find a space for all of them. So every year we go through the process of constructing this performance, not only based on the size and the characteristics of the cast, but of, based on also the stories that they're dealing with. For example, we always have a present day scene at the end of the show. It's different every time. Present day issues of 2007 are not the present day issues of 2016. And so we're in constant conversation with the youth in the production about the making of the production. What scenes, what the scenes mean, who the characters are, what stories we're going to be reflecting in each of the scenes. And that's the thing that I really wanted to understand. And the other thing is, all of these stories are told through embodied storytelling, right? They're getting on stage, and this is something that I say to them all the time, like, we're not gonna be standing on stage with you saying, okay, audience, this scene is about this. This is what this person is trying to represent. You become the storytellers, and you have to do it in a way that only uses your body and its relationship to the music, to the sound. You don't get to use words. You don't get to use your voice. So anyway, I interviewed these students, and some of them are 30 years old now with their own kids. Some of them are 18. Some of them did the show once. Some of them did the show 15 times. And what I learned was that in the process of developing this production, learning the choreography, helping to build the sets, learning the stories of the characters they needed to portray, embodying these stories, training in a community of learners that was focused on situating their life experiences within a historical context, and utilizing creative embodiment as a resource for sense making. The process was transformative for the young dancers who were a part of the production. In this context, dance became a powerful tool for the young artists who were in the cast. Through the process of engaging in the making of the production, youth obviously learn some things about their history, but they also develop self-awareness, critical consciousness, positive identity, and radical hope. And these are the elements of radical healing. So radical healing is a framework that provides a lens for making sense of how participating in community-based activities can support youth in healing from systemic trauma, from healing from the impacts of things like systemic racism, um, and can help them to develop resilience through a process that's grounded in healing and not just coping. We do a lot of asking our kids to cope. We say, okay, we know this environment's kind of messed up for you. You know school isn't quite working, but just, you know, deal with it, get through it. Develop grit, I think is the thing we, we try to call it. Develop some resilience and you'll make it through. And grit and resilience are super important. But I'm really interested in understanding how these processes can actually lead to healing healthy whole human beings. I want to better understand today how creative arts integrated STEM environments can also support this kind of radical healing. How arts integrated approaches to STEM teaching and learning can create space for the healing of things like systemic trauma, intergenerational trauma by promoting positive associations with STEM that are rooted and grounded in positive associations with self and culture. Focusing on STEM and arts as a resource for, as I said, the development of whole, healthy human beings. As we think about how we want to educate our children for the future, it's critical that we recognize the importance of developing the whole person to see our youth not as human doings, but as human beings, to invest in their humanity. The arts can be a resource for STEM learning and engagement for sure. However, we shouldn't think of them as mere tools to help our children perform better on STEM tasks or to get better grades or higher SAT scores, but as resources that allow them to develop additional lenses, richer perspectives on the things that they're learning, alternative approaches for problem solving, the ability to sit with ideas in tension and be okay with uncertainty, to understand complex systems, to embrace the messiness of life and the world, to develop critical perspectives, joy, and well-being. The arts are a key part of a transformative shift in thinking about how we educate our youth, 
how we prepare them for a future that we can't even imagine yet. They're an essential component of a comprehensive education.